Section thirteen of the Ingoldsby Legends First Series. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ingoldsby Legends First Series by Richard Harris Barham. Section thirteen. The when, the where, and the how of the succeeding narrative speak for themselves. It may be proper, however, to observe that the ruins here alluded to, and improperly termed the Abbey, are not those of Bolsover, described in a preceding page but the remains of a preceptory once belonging to the knights templar situate near swinfield swinkfield or as it is now generally spelt and pronounced swingfield minis a rough tract of common land now undergoing the process of enclosure and adjoining the woods and arable lands of tappington at the distance of some two miles from the hall to the southeastern windows of which the time-worn walls in question as seen over the intervening coppices present a picturesque and striking object the witch's frolic scene the snuggery at tappington grandpapa in a high-backed cane-bottomed elbow-chair of carved walnut-tree dozing his nose at an angle of forty-five degrees his thumbs slowly perform the rotatory motion described by lexicographers as twiddling the hope of the family astride on a walking-stick with burnt cork mustachios and a pheasant's tail pinned in his cap solaceth himself with martial music roused by a strain of surpassing dissonance grandpapa loquitur come hither come hither my little boy ned come hither unto my knee i cannot away with that horrible din that sixpenny drum and that trumpet of tin O oh, better to wander frank and free through the fair of good saint bartlemy than list to such awful minstrelsy now lay little ned those nuisances by and i'll read ye a lay of grammary grandpapa riseth yawneth like the crater of an extinct volcano proceedeth slowly to the window and apostrophizeth the abbey in the distance i love thy tower grey ruin i joy thy form to see though reft of all cell cloister and hall nothing is left save a tottering wall that awfully grand and darkly dull threatened to fall and demolish my skull as ages ago i wandered along careless thy grass-grown courts among in sky-blue jacket and trousers laced the latter uncommonly short in the waist thou art dearer to me thou ruin grey than the squire's veranda over the way and fairer i ween the ivy sheen that thy mouldering turret binds than the alderman's house about half a mile off with the green venetian blinds full many a tale would my grandam tell in many a bygone day of darksome deeds which of old befell in thee thou ruin grey and i the readiest ear would lend and stare like frightened pig while my grandfather's hair would have stood on end had he not worn a wig one tale i remember of mickle dread now lith and listen my little boy ned thou mayst have read my little boy ned though thy mother thine idless blames in dr goldsmith's history book of a gentleman called king james in quilted doublet and great trunk breeches who held in abhorrence tobacco and witches well in king james golden days for the days were golden then they could not be less for good queen bess had died aged threescore and ten and her days we know were all of them so while the court poet sung and the court gallant swore that the days were as golden still as before some people tis true a troublesome few who historical points would unsettle have lately thrown out a sort of a doubt of the genuine ring of the metal but who can believe to a monarch so wise people would dare tell a parcel of lies well then in good king james's days golden or not does not matter a jot yon ruin a sort of a roof had got for though repairs lacking its walls had been cracking since harry the eighth sent its people a-packing 
though joists and floors and windows and doors had all disappeared yet pillars by scores remained and still propped up a ceiling or two while the belfry was almost as good as new you are not to suppose matters looked just so in the ruin some two hundred years ago just in that farthermost angle where there are still the remains of a winding stair one turret especially high in the air upreared its tall gaunt form as if defying the power of fate or the hand of time the innovator and though to the pitiless storm its weaker brethren all around bowing in ruin had strewed the ground alone it stood while its fellows lay strewed like a four-bottle man in a company screwed not firm on his legs but by no means subdued one night twas in sixteen hundred and six i like when i can ned the date to fix the month was may though i can't well say at this distance of time the particular day but oh that night that horrible night folks ever afterwards said with affright that they never had seen such a terrible sight the sun had gone down fiery red and if that evening he laid his head in theta's lap beneath the seas he must have scalded the goddess knees he left behind him a lurid track of blood-red light upon clouds so black that warren and hunt and the whole of their crew could scarcely have given them a darker hue there came a shrill and a whistling sound above beneath beside and around yet leaf ne'er moved on tree so that some people thought old beelzebub must have been locked out of doors and was blowing the dust from the pipe of his street door key and then a hollow moaning blast came sounding more dismally still than the last and the lightning flashed and the thunder growled and louder and louder the tempest howled and the rain came down in such sheets as would stagger a barred with a simile short of niagara rob gilpin was a citizen bad though of some renown of no great credit in his own or any other town he was a wild and roving lad forever in the alehouse boozing or romping which is quite as bad with female friends of his own choosing and rob this very day had made not dreaming such a storm was ruin an assignation with miss slade their trysting place that same grey ruin but gertrude slade became afraid and to keep her appointment unwilling when she spied the rain on her window-pane in drops as big as a shilling she put off her hat and her mantle again he'll never expect me in all this rain but little he recks of the fears of the sex or that maiden false to her tryst could be he had stood there a good half hour ere yet had commenced that perilous shower alone by the trysting tree robin looks east robin looks west but he sees not her whom he loves the best robin looks up and robin looks down but no one comes from the neighbouring town the storm came at last loud roared the blast and the shades of evening fell thick and fast the tempest grew and the straggling yew his leafy umbrella was wet through and through rob was half dead with cold and with fright when he spies in the ruins a twinkling light a hop two skips and a jump and straight rob stands within that postern gate and there were gossips sitting there by one by two by three two were an old ill-favoured pair but the third was young and passing fair with laughing eyes and with coal-black hair a dainty queen was she rob would have given his ears to sip but a single salute from her cherry lip as they sat in that old and haunted room in each one's hand was a huge birch broom on each one's head was a steeple-crowned hat on each one's knee was a coal-black cat each had a kirtle of lincoln green it was i trow a fearsome scene now riddle me riddle me right madge gray what foot unhallowed wends this way goody price goody price now a read me right who roams the old ruins this drearysome night 
then up and spake that sonsy queen and she spake both loud and clear o oh, be it for weal or be it for woe enter friend or enter foe rob gilpin is welcome here now tread we a measure a hall a hall now tread we a measure quoth she the heart of robin beat thick and throbbing roving bob tread a measure with me ay lassie quoth rob as her hand he gripes though satan himself were blowing the pipes now around they go and around and around with hop skip and jump and frolicsome bound such sailing and gliding such sinking and sliding such lofty curvetting and grand pirouetting ned you would swear that monsieur gilbert and miss tavioni were capering there and oh such awful music ne'er fell sound so uncanny on mortal ear there were the tones of a dying man's groans mixed with the rattling of dead men's bones had ye heard the shrieks and the squeals and the squeaks you'd not have forgotten the sound for weeks and around and around and around they go heel to heel and toe to toe prance and caper curvet and wheel toe to toe and heel to heel tis merry tis merry comers i trow to dance thus beneath the nightshade bough goody price goody price now riddle me right where may we sup this frolicsome night mine host of the dragon hath mutton and veal the squire hath partridge and widgeon and teal but old sir topas hath daintier cheer a pasty made of the good red deer a huge grouse pie and a fine florentine a fat roast goose and a turkey and chine madge grey madge grey now tell me i pray where's the best wassail bowl to our roundelay there is ale in the cellars of tappington hall but the squire is a churl and his drink is small mine host of the dragon hath many a flagon of double ale lamb's wool and eau de vie but sir topas the vicar hath costlier liquor a butt of the choicest malvoisie he doth not lack canary or sack and a good pint stoop of clary wine smacks merrily off with a turkey and chine now away and away without delay hey cockalorum my broomstick gay we must be back ere the dawn of the day hey up the chimney away away old goody price mounts in a trice in showing her legs she is not over nice old goody jones all skin and bones follows like winking away go the crones knees and nose in a line with the toes sitting their brooms like so many de crows latest and last the damsel passed one glance of her coal-black eye she cast she laughed with glee loud laughters three dost fear rob gilpin to ride with me oh never might man unscathed espy one single glance from that coal-black eye away she flew without more ado rob seizes and mounts on a broomstick too hey up the chimney lass hey after you it's a very fine thing on a fine day in june to ride through the air in a nassau balloon but you'll find very soon if you aim at the moon in a carriage like that you're a bit of a spoon for the largest can't fly above twenty miles high and you're not halfway then on your journey nor nigh while no man alive could ever contrive mr green has declared to get higher than five and the soundest philosophers hold that perhaps if you reached twenty miles your balloon would collapse or pass by such action the sphere of attraction getting into the track of some comet good lack tis a thousand to one that you'd never come back and the boldest of mortals a danger like that must fear rashly protruding beyond our own atmosphere no no when i try a trip to the sky i shan't go in that thing of yours mr guy though messrs monk mason and spencer and beasley all join in saying it travels so easily no there's nothing so good as a pony of wood not like that which of late they stuck up on the gate at the end of the park which caused so much debate and gave so much trouble to make it stand straight but a regular broomstick you'll find that the favourite 
above all when like robin you haven't to pay for it stay really i dread i am losing the thread of my tale and it's time you should be in your bed so lith now and listen my little boy ned the vicarage walls are lofty and thick and the copings are stone and the sides are brick the casements are narrow and bolted and barred and the stout oak door is heavy and hard moreover by way of additional guard a great big dog runs loose in the yard and a horseshoe is nailed on the threshold sill to keep out aught that savours of ill but alack the chimney-pot's open still that great big dog begins to quail between his hind legs he drops his tail crouched on the ground the terrified hound gives vent to a very odd sort of a sound it is not a bark loud open and free as an honest old watchdog's bark should be it is not a yelp it is not a growl but a something between a whine and a howl and hark a sound from the window high responds to the watchdog's pitiful cry it is not a moan it is not a groan it comes from a nose but is not what a nose produces in healthy and sound repose yet sir topas the vicar is fast asleep and his respirations are heavy and deep he snores tis true but he snores no more as he's aye been accustomed to snore before and as men of his kidney are wont to snore sir topas weight is sixteen stone four he draws his breath like a man distressed by pain or grief or like one oppressed by some ugly old incubus perched on his breast a something seems to disturb his dreams and thrice on his ear distinct and clear falls a voice as of somebody whispering near in still small accents faint and few hey down the chimney-pot hey after you throughout the vicarage near and far there is no lack of bolt or of bar there are plenty of locks to closet and box yet the pantry wicket is standing ajar and the little low door through which you must go down some half-dozen steps to the cellar below is also unfastened though no one may know by so much as a guess how it comes to be so for wicket and door the evening before were both of them locked and the key safely placed on the bunch that hangs down from the housekeeper's waist oh twas a jovial sight to view in that snug little cellar that frolicsome crew old goody price had got something nice a turkey poult larded with bacon and spice old goody jones would touch naught that had bones she might just as well mumble a parcel of stones goody jones in sooth hath got never a tooth and a new college pudding of marrow and plums is the dish of all others that suiteth her gums madge gray was picking the breast of a chicken her coal-black eye with its glance so sly was fixed on rob gilpin himself sitting by with his heart full of love and his mouth full of pie grouse pie with hair in the middle is fair which duly concocted with science and care dr kitchener says is beyond all compare and a tenderer leveret robin had never et so in after times oft was he wont to assever it now pledge we the wine-cup a health a health sweet are the pleasures obtained by stealth fill up fill up the brim of the cup is the part that i holdeth the toothsomest sup here's to thee goody price goody jones to thee to thee roving rob and again to me many a sip never a slip come to us four twixt the cup and the lip the cups pass quick the toasts fly thick rob tries in vain out their meaning to pick but here's the words scratch and old bogey and nick more familiar grown now he stands up alone volunteering to give them a toast of his own a bumper of wine fill thine fill mine here's a health to old noah who planted the vine oh then what sneezing what coughing and wheezing ensued in a way that was not over pleasing goody price goody jones and the pretty madge gray all seemed as their liquor had gone the wrong way but the best of the joke was the moment he spoke those words which the party seemed almost to choke as by mentioning noah some spell had been broke every soul in the house at that instant awoke 
and hearing the din from barrel and bin drew at once the conclusion that thieves had got in up jumped the cook and caught hold of her spit up jumped the groom and took bridle and bit up jumped the gardener and shouldered his spade up jumped the scullion the footman the maid the two last by the way occasioned some scandal by appearing together with only one candle which gave for unpleasant surmises some handle up jumped the swineherd and up jumped the big boy a nondescript under him acting as pig boy butler housekeeper coachman from bottom to top everybody jumped up without parley or stop with the weapon which first in their way chanced to drop whip warming pan wig block mug musket and mop last of all doth appear with some symptoms of fear sir topas in person to bring up the rear in a mixed kind of costume half pontificalibus half what scholars denominate pure naturalibus nay the truth to express as you'll easily guess they have none of them time to attend much to dress but he or she as the case may be he or she seizes what he or she pleases trunk hosen or kirtles and shirts or chemises and thus one and all great and small short and tall muster at once in the vicarage hall with upstanding locks starting eyes shortened breath like the folks in the gallery scene in macbeth when macduff is announcing their sovereign's death and hark what accents clear and strong to the listening throng came floating along tis robin encoring himself in a song very good song very well sung jolly companions every one on on to the cellar away away on on to the cellar without more delay the whole posse rush onwards in battle array conceive the dismay of the party so gay old goody jones goody price and madge gray when the door bursting open they descried the allied troops prepared for the onslaught roll in like a tide and the spits and the tongs and the pokers beside boots and saddles the word mount comers and ride alarm was ne'er caused more strong in indigen house by cats among rats or a hawk in a pigeon house quick from the view away they all flew with a yell and a screech and a hollabaloo hey up the chimney hey after you the volscians themselves made an exit less speedy from corioli fluttered like doves by macready they are gone save one robin alone robin whose high state of civilization precludes all idea of air or station and who now has no notion of more locomotion than suffices to kick with much zeal and devotion right and left at the party who pounced on their victim and mauled him and kicked him and licked him and pricked him as they bore him away scarce aware what was done and believing it all but a part of the fun hick hiccuping out the same strain he'd begun jol jolly companions every one morning gray scarce bursts into day ere at tappington hall there's the deuce to pay the tables and chairs are all placed in array in the old oak parlour and in and out domestics and neighbours a motley rout are walking and whispering and standing about and the squire is there in his large armchair leaning back with a grave magisterial air in the front of a seat a huge volume called fleeta and bracton a tome of an old-fashioned look and coke upon littleton then a new book and he moistens his lips with occasional sips from a luscious sack posset that smiles in a tankard close by on a side table not that he drank hard but because at that day i hardly need say the hong merchants had not yet invented hao kuei nor as yet would you see su shong or bo hei at the tables of persons of any degree how our ancestors managed to do without tea i must fairly confess is a mystery to me yet your lydgates and chaucers had no cups and saucers their breakfast in fact and the best they could get was a sort of a dejeuner a la fourchette instead of our slops they had cutlets and chops and sack possets and ale and stoops tankards and pots 
and they wound up the meal with rump steaks and shallots now the squire lifts his hand with an air of command and gives them a sign which they all understand to bring in the culprit and straightway the carter and huntsmen drag in that unfortunate martyr still kicking and crying come what are you arter the charge is prepared and the evidence clear he was caught in the cellar a drinking the beer and came there there's very great reason to fear with companions to say but the least of them queer such as witches and creatures with horrible features and horrible grins and hooked noses and chins who'd been playing the deuce with his reverence's bins the face of his worship grows graver and graver as the parties detail robin's shameful behaviour mr buzzard the clerk while the tale is reciting sits down to reduce the affair into writing with all proper diction and due legal fiction viz that he the said prisoner as clearly was shown conspiring with folks to deponents unknown with divers that is to say two thousand people in two thousand hats each hat peaked like a steeple with force and with arms and with sorcery and charms upon two thousand brooms entered four thousand rooms to wit two thousand pantries and two thousand cellars put in bodily fear twenty thousand indwellers and with sundry that is to say two thousand forks drew divers that is to say ten thousand corks and with malice propense down their two thousand throttles emptied various that is to say ten thousand bottles all in breach of the peace moved by satan's malignity and in spite of king james and his crown and his dignity at words so profound rob gazes around but no glance sympathetic to cheer him is found no glance did i say yes one madge gray she is there in the midst of the crowd standing by and she gives him one glance from her coal black eye one touch to his hand and one word to his ear that's a line which i've stolen from sir walter i fear while nobody near seems to see her or hear as his worship takes up and surveys with a strict eye the broom now produced is the corpus delicti ere his fingers can clasp it is snatched from his grasp the end poked in his chest with a force makes him gasp and despite the decorum so due to the quorum his worship's upset and so too is his jorum and madge is astride on the broomstick before him hocus pocus quick presto and hey cockalorum mount mount for your life rob sir justice adieu hey up the chimney-pot hey after you through the mystified group with a halloo and a whoop madge on the pommel and robin on croup the pair through the air right as if in a chair while the party below stand mouth open and stare clean bumbazed and amazed and fixed all the roomstick oh what's gone with robin and madge and the broomstick ay what's gone indeed ned of what befell madge gray and the broomstick i never heard tell but robin was found that morn on the ground in yon old gray ruin again safe and sound except that at first he complained much of thirst and a shocking bad headache of all ills the worst and close by his knee a flask you might see but an empty one smelling of eau de vie rob from this hour is an altered man he runs home to his lodgings as fast as he can sticks to his trade marries miss slade becomes a teetotaler that is the same as teetotalers now one in all but the name grows fond of small beer which is always a steady sign never drinks spirits except as a medicine learns to despise coal black eyes minds pretty girls no more than so many guys has a family lives to be sixty and dies now my little boy ned brush off to your bed tie your nightcap on safe or a napkin instead or these terrible nights you'll catch cold in your head and remember my tale and the moral it teaches which you'll find much the same as what solomon preaches 
don't flirt with young ladies don't practice soft speeches avoid waltzes quadrilles pumps silk hose and knee breeches frequent not grey ruins shun riot and revelry hocus pocus and conjuring and all sorts of devilry don't meddle with broomsticks they're beelzebub's switches of cellars keep clear they're the devil's own ditches and beware of balls banquetings brandy and witches above all don't run after black eyes if you do depend on t you'll find what i say will come true old nick some fine morning will hay after you note on the squire of tappington stephen ingoldsby surnamed the niggard second cousin and successor to the bad sir giles visitation of kent 1666 for an account of his murder by burglars and their subsequent execution see dodsley's remarkable trials etc london 1776 volume 2 page 264 x the present volume article hand of glory end of note end of section 13